And now, the game. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it. Yes, Cook. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, 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 Brady gets terrific. Throws it, and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And as the book here says, right on my studio desk, it is now time for the one-game season. It is time for the game. And cherish this because this is a dynamic that may never exist again the rest of our lives. What has made the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry so unique and why it has often been described as either the greatest rivalry in college football or maybe the greatest rivalry in American team sports, period. In fact, there was an ESPN poll at the turn of the century uh, that it was voted the number one rivalry in American sports for the 20th century. Uh, There's a unique dynamic here. Well, there's two, really. Number one, these are two states that once threatened to declare war on each other. Right, That doesn't happen every day, okay? And so that's how Toledo ended up uh, part of Ohio and the UP ended up part of Michigan. That was the settlement that uh, the federal government negotiated between the two, right? So it doesn't happen every day that uh, individual states um, are about to go to war. So that's kind of the, the genesis of all of this. But the other factor here is the simultaneous greatness of both of these teams and the winner-take-all aspect of the rivalry. Now, last year, this, this veil was torn a little bit when there were some shakeups at the end and really nobody stood out for the fourth slot. And so Ohio state was still managed to slip into the college football playoff. And, and then, you know, uh, they acquitted themselves quite well. That was a, that was a national championship level performance. The Buckeyes put on against Georgia, no question about it. And um, as the clock struck midnight there on new year's Eve, they were a field goal away from winning that semifinal. But at the end of that game in Columbus last November, Almost nobody thought that was going to be the case. In fact, Ryan Day was talking about how dark the football offices were that whole next week. No one was in town. No one was hanging around. Everybody basically thought the season was over and guys are getting ready for the draft. Okay. So moving forward, though, no divisions, 12-team college football playoff. There are going to be seasons where Michigan and Ohio State are going to play twice. We may even live, I don't know how easy this will be, given how deep uh, the Big Ten will be, but we will. there will be years, it won't be every year, certainly, the, the other two programs, the other programs in this league are too good, particularly uh, at the top, but there are going to be years we're going to see Michigan and Ohio State twice. There, are gonna, there, there might even be a year that we see it thrice, 
you know, you look at Duke, North Carolina and college basketball is the closest to Michigan, Ohio State that that sport has. But they haven't really been in a position a lot to ruin the other seasons. In fact, as great as both of those programs are, they've only met in the Final Four one time, and that was Coach K's last year, and North Carolina sent him off into retirement. This has been a regular occurrence in this game. The, the available opportunity to ruin the season, to, to effectively cancel the season of your opponent, to, have, to play an entire year of football, an entire schedule, Months of grueling physical contests and put in the work and get all the W's you need. And then at the very end, have the team you hate the most just ruin it for you and make you feel as if everything you did the last three months is irrelevant and didn't happen. Wasn't, didn't, it didn't matter because you failed at the end. That dynamic doesn't exist in any of their rivalry. It just doesn't. For a while, it existed. Maybe the closest was the Yankees and Red Sox. In the same division, only one team each division makes a playoff so they could ruin each other. But now we have wild cards in baseball. Multiple teams make it. We've had plenty of years where the Yankees and Red Sox have both made it. We've had years where they've even played in the ALCS together, right? So you're, you're, you can now be simultaneously great. You can, they can each now simultaneously you know, attain all their goals but one. That's not been the case in this rivalry. You know, winning your division, you know, winning the Big Ten, you know, winning the national championship, usually without beating the other team. The, the closest we've seen a couple of years ago when Maryland should have beaten Ohio State on a two-point conversion and Michigan would have clinched the Big Ten championship even before going to Columbus. And then the next week, Michigan, you know, got humiliated and, and Urban Meyer put up a 60-burger on Michigan in his last game of the game. That's what makes this so unique is that – more times than not, every, it just seems, it's almost it's not perennially, but it seems as if every single year there is an opportunity for one of these teams to ruin the other team's season. Just ruin it. And that's going to go away after this year. We're going to go to the 12-team playoff. Most years, both of these teams are going to make it. Pretty much every year, at least one of them will. And that's going to change the stakes of this a little bit. Now, I, I think what's what's developing off the field with Connor Scallions or Stallions, I should say, and uh, and now we're you know people are looking into Ohio State and there and and did they take Penn State's you know practice footage allegedly and did they steal signs too? And I know national media outlets are looking at that. That's the one thing that about this rivalry, if if the if the existential stakes are not going to be there moving forward where just almost every time they play, one of them can ruin the other one's season in some way, shape, or form. This now might get more emotionally heated than it has been. For the most part, this has been a rivalry of mutual respect. Hasn't descended into the levels of zealous insanity of an Alabama-Auburn Iron Bowl, for example. But for a long time, Michigan fan just was never going to reach the, the level of vitriol for Ohio State that Ohio State has for them. You know, everybody's got their weaknesses. For Ohio State fan, it's insanity. Uh, for the Michigan fan, it's sanctimony, okay? But the firm belief in whether this is true or not, we'll find out. This is all being investigated as we speak and will all be confirmed probably at some point this offseason. We'll, we'll, we'll find out whether these rumors or not are true. But it's becoming almost urban legend now in Michigan circles that Michigan's current issues with the Big Ten and the NCAA lie squarely at the feet of Ohio State. And it may not have the existential stakes. It, it just might be a lot more spiteful and personal, though, than it has been. And if Ohio State fan was wondering, man, we beat you all even like 20 years in a row and you still didn't hate us as much as we hate you, what's it going to take? Well, we're starting to find out. Michigan fan is starting to match you uh, vitriol for vitriol, rancor for rancor. And so while they may not have the opportunity to ruin the other's season as often as they have in the era that we've all grown up in, in this new era, this thing might be nastier and more vicious than it ever was before. Now, what about the game itself? 
We'll break it down more with Mark Rogers here in a moment so that you can have both a Buckeye and Wolverine perspective simultaneously. I, I think there are several matchups in this game that favor Michigan. The one thing, on a, just from a mental block perspective, I can't get over, I, I can't see Ryan Day losing to a team that doesn't have a coach. Well, he's there all week except game days. Well, you know, if it wasn't important to have the coach on game day, then why do coaches show up? It's, and it's not easy. to. There's a reason why teams have three different people do head coach, offensive coordinator, and offensive line coach. In fact, let me show you this just as one example. All right. Michigan in the three games that Sharon Moore has handled all three of those jobs, head coach, OC, OL coach. Michigan suffered easily its three most anemic offensive yardage outputs of the year. Its, its highest total yards in those three games, 312 against Bowling Green. That's not, that's not good. J.J. McCarthy in those three games has a 55.4 QBR. He has a 91.9 QBR the rest of the season. So I, I don't know I, I, I don't know how to numerically, metrically quantify not having a coach for a game of this magnitude. I don't know. You know, I, I heard a respected handicapper this week say that Jordan Travis was worth about a touchdown in the line to him for Florida State. That's how much of a downgrade he gave them without him and with a backup quarterback now. And for Michigan, he thought it was probably a point, point and a half without Harbaugh. Okay. I know it's not zero. Those numbers I just showed you, proved to you, it's not zero. So you can't say it doesn't matter at all. And you can kind of see it in the line. I mean, Michigan's power rating with home field advantage is around six. Uh, it would be minus six in this game. At the time we're recording this, it's, oh, it's Michigan minus three. So I think a lot of that is people, and if they're betting this early, it's almost always pros, sharps, trying to figure out what – what is Jim? What is not having a head coach, particularly a, a Hall of Fame one? What 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 is the factor of not having him on the sidelines? And I'm having a I'm having a hard time, despite the fact there are at least two or three matchups in this game I think distinctively favor Michigan, and maybe only one matchup in this game I think distinctively favors Ohio State, and the rest of them they're pretty even, Stephen. No pun intended. I just can't mentally get around. But your head coach isn't there, and that has to count. For something, especially in a game of this magnitude. So we'll find out. And when we come back, we'll break it down. We'll get into more of the X's and O's and those matchups with Mark Rogers here next. Steve Dace here, and we get asked a lot, hey, how can we support what you guys are doing at Michigan Podcast? Well, now is a great time to become one of our supporters on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast is where you can go. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And if you go there, we're going to make you a little jingle. Uh, in fact, you would have gotten these a few months ago, before the, long before the season even started. All of my 2023 football futures bets I've made thus far. I can't recommend a selection any more than I bet this myself. And last year, if you followed my football futures bets and you bet alongside of me, you made a pretty nice ROI chunk of change by the time the season ended. So keep up to date on all things we think and do uh, here at Michigan Podcast, patreon.com at Michigan Podcast. But more importantly, just five bucks a month. And chances are you're going to make a lot more money than that following our sports betting selections. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. Again, patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And thanks to all of you that have been supporting us already. We appreciate each and every one of you. Go Blue. Well, let's get another point of view from our good friend Mark Rogers, who all weeks but this one is a relatively reasonable bucknut. Nevertheless, we'll let him on the show again this week, as we would any other week, knowing full well we'll regret it after the fact. But you can still watch his outstanding channel here on YouTube, The Voice of College Football, despite the sheer homerism you are about to be subjected to. Mark, good to see you, brother. How are you? This is the week to do it, so I will go full throttle at it. Uh, I'm peering at that shirt, which seems to have been a horrible fashion decision on your part. Oh, you mean this shirt? Yes, yeah, that okay. shirt. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, let's begin. Um, what do you think is the matchup that will decide this game on Saturday? I think that Kyle McCord is the 
most important player on the field. And I hate to be so obvious. And I know that this Ohio State offense doesn't rely on him like C.J. Stroud was relied upon and the two previous Ohio State quarterbacks. But he has not shown that level of play. And he won't be that quarterback on Saturday either unless he just plays out of his mind in the best game of his life. He will be who he is. Hopefully, that will be enough for Ohio State. But uh, he cannot turn the ball over. He cannot put the ball in harm's way as he has done more times than his statistics would show. And if he does that against a Michigan defense uh, and a guy like a Mike Sandra still, who all you have to do is throw in the game tape from last week against Maryland is a ball hawk. And there are others, Will Johnson, that aren't just guys that are going to knock a ball down or deflect it, but they will uh, take it in for their own and turn the ball over uh, for the Michigan side. So Kyle McCord, of course, is uh, the most important player on the field. So that's the starting point for Ohio State, even if he only throws it 25 times and not the customary 40 or 45 out of a C.J. Stroud or Justin Fields. It's going to be 25 high leverage plays that they're going to need out of him. I, I think the key matchup in this game, from my perspective, is 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 going to come down to which team can protect its own quarterback. I think that's more important in Ohio State's case because I don't think that um, I don't think McCord has the escapability, obviously, that J.J. McCarthy has. But we've also seen J.J. got banged up against Penn State, and you really saw them limit the offensive game plan against Maryland last week. Uh, I don't think they ran a uh, a back-to-the-line-of-scrimmage play-action pass until the last offensive possession of the game. Okay, um, You didn't see him keep on a single zone read the entire game. Uh, he was limping much of the game. So is, was that a one-week precaution? Is it one of those things where he's going to play because it's Ohio State, but he's not healthy? And we won't know uh, until Saturday. But if you look at, you know, you look at Kyle McCord. I, this is the this this guy has the this is the biggest split of any quarterback in college football. He has top ten QBR in America from a clean pocket. He is a hundred and tenth QBR in America when under pressure. No, there isn't a starting quarterback in America that has that chasm of a split. And so I think it really comes down to, we've seen Michigan have pass pro issues two weeks in a row. Well, really one player, uh, Carson Barnhart, the tackle have pass pro issues two weeks in a row uh, against Penn state. I'll give him a pass that environment. You're not going to hear a snap count. You're going to advance chop Robinson might be a top 10 pick in next week, next year's NFL draft. Okay. You know I mean? If you're, he's Carson's probably sixth, seventh round draft pick. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world that you couldn't block a top 10 pick in the draft. I'm much more concerned about what happened against Maryland. Same exact thing when he had to move to the left side after the injury to Miles Hinton there. It was Ole. I mean, it was a jailbreak to the quarterback right off the snap, the exact same thing. I almost wonder if he's banged up and we don't know because he's just giving up leverage on just outside speed rushes so easily. Is there a plant, uh, plant, a foot planting issue, a strength issue there? Is he banged up and we don't know? Um, but that's more of a factor if J.J.'s mobility is limited. And then you know, Kyle McCord has limited mobility. And so it's not just the pressure you put on him, but how. You certainly don't want to give him the kind of looks that he can just arm punt it out to Marvin Harrison or Emeka Abuka and say, you know, here's 50-50 balls, go get it. You know, we don't want to play that, you know. Um, so you want to mix up looks. You want to make him have to read a defense under pressure. But I, I think that's the matchup that will decide the game is is who's – which team is able to better protect their quarterback? Well, on the Michigan side, I got to think that there is something wrong with Barnhart because here's an experienced player that has not shown that level of, of ineptitude previously. So uh, Ladarius Henderson's out. Miles Hinton, I don't know what his status is, but he left the game last week. So there are d obvious concerns there. And J.J. McCarthy, yes, escapability is not even close between the two quarterbacks. Now, the one thing I will say about Kyle McCord that could be baked into those statistics is that he was receiving more pressure early in the season when he was a less effective quarterback. So the two kind of go hand in hand to a certain extent. Uh, the offensive line issues have been cleaned up to a large degree. Now, we'll, they'll be put to the ultimate test uh, this week, even more so than Penn State in certain respects, uh, because 
they're probably going to have to score more points this week than they did against Penn State. But also that um, I think the offensive line has improved with his uh, increased level of play. I think those have gone hand in hand. What is your biggest concern as an Ohio State fan? Well, I touched on McCord, so I'm not going to go there again, but it starts with him. It also starts with a running game that has been largely effective, and Travion Henderson is certainly uh, one reason I'm as confident as I am today, more so than I was six weeks ago, is because he is all of the number one back in the nation that he was coming out of high school. I'm not saying he's the best back in the nation, but he's not, he's just a different guy. Since he's come back from this injury, he's just a more determined runner. He's lowering his shoulder. He's a physical back that he wasn't before. Okay. Concerns. Yes. Offensive line. Not so much that I have concerns about Ohio state uh, and, and their lack of uh, effectiveness recently because they've been a good offensive line and they've taken care of a lot of the communication mistakes and the physical mistakes. And I think they better know what their limitations are as an offensive lineman, that some of the line play isn't as, as athletic as it used to be, so they're calling different plays. So I think they know who they are and what they've got, but just Michigan outplaying them up front. They had an NFL-loaded offensive line two years ago, but Aiden Hutchinson still abused them uh, on the left side of the offensive line. So that would be one concern is that they just get beat up front like they have the last two years along the offensive line. The other would be that they don't have a changeup uh, in the passing game despite a loaded wide receiver room to Marvin Harrison. Because if Michigan can do something, whether they really want to go to the degree of bracketing Marvin Harrison, uh, that Emeka Buka has not been the player that he was last year, mostly due to injury. And if Kyle McCord's not given the type of time that they need to be effective downfield running routes, that limits the explosiveness of wide receivers. And even if you've got great wide receivers, if you're keeping them to five to seven yard routes, that, that severely impedes their, their ability to be explosive and helps the secondary out. And, and as I mentioned, a really good Michigan secondary with two players that I think are uh, elite level in San Rastill and Johnson. I actually think our defensive line is better than it was a year ago. I mean, in fact, I think it's considerably better. Uh, because I think the interior of that line, um, we've always been very deep and athletic at edge since Jim took over. We've put a bunch of edge guys in the NFL, but the that interior trio of of Kenneth Grant, Chris Jenkins, and and Mason Graham is one of the best interior trio defensive tackles at Michigan I've ever seen, and I've been a I've been a fan since 1983. So I'll tell you what my biggest concern is on the Michigan side of things. Well, and there's another X factor, too, here we should address. I mean, Blake Corum's never been healthy for a Michigan-Ohio State game. He is now. Uh, Donovan Edwards wasn't healthy last year. Remember, he had uh, the fibula injury that we didn't find out about until after the year, and then he had the hand injury that had him carry the ball. Go ahead, say that again. (laughs) He was healthy enough. He was healthy enough, yeah. I actually went back and watched last year's game last night, and – I just forgot how awkward he looked, man, carrying, doing everything in that left hand, how awkward that looked. But it was effective, obviously. So both of these guys are healthy. Michigan has used them sparingly throughout the course of the season by their standards. Last week was, uh, was absolutely the highest usage Quorum's gotten all year with 28 carries. I mean, most of the most games he's not even gotten to 20 this year. They've sparingly used him. Uh, Edwards has played his two best games in terms of uh, instinctive running back to back. So we're going to see, you know, against what I think is a, an improved Ohio State defense, uh, we're going to we're going to see these two things kind of butt heads, where these two guys are going to be healthy together, but also going to go up against a, a more formidable Ohio State defensive front. You've reminded me of another concern that I have, and I love this Ohio State defense. I love this defense. I want to say that it's the best defense in the country, but I might be bleeding a little scarlet and gray, but I think it's awfully close. I think we're seeing two of the top four defenses in the country play on Saturday, but for as comfortable as I am with Ohio State's secondary at the cornerback position matching up against wide receivers, Depending on what the matchups are, whether that's safety or linebacker on Colston Loveland 
and A.J. Barner, that could be problematic uh, in trying to keep up with those guys. Ohio State's linebackers have been really good against the run. Tommy Eichenberg in particular, not so much against the pass. And Colton Loveland, ever since I saw him break onto the scene, I just thought he was a great player and an emerging player, just a difficult matchup for just about anyone. So that could be problematic. I'll, I'll tell you my biggest concern is from a Michigan perspective. And I, I pointed this out with a, uh, with a graphic in the, uh, in the opening uh, portion of the show. Um, I, I, there must be a reason that teams hire three different guys to do these jobs, okay? Head coach, offensive coordinator, and offensive line coach. There, there must be a reason why those jobs are so tough, so difficult, it requires more than one person to perform them simultaneously. And, 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 and I don't know. I, I don't know how you can quantify it. I, I, you know, I had a respected handicapper uh, that, uh, that I follow. I listened to him this week. He said that he thought Jordan Travis was worth a full touchdown in the line for Florida State. He thought at most Jim Harbaugh was worth a point and a half. Okay. So you, you have a, a situation where that, you know, we're, we're kind of to the, is it the Jimmies and the Joes or the X's and the O's? All right. But, and, and maybe you could say Michigan's almost used to this now. Okay. It's been half the season. They've gone with this kind of an arrangement. It's not kind of a sudden change for them. But what, what I see, and I've not seen a bunch of clunkiness, like, you know, extra penalties or anything. We had some extra timeouts we had to use to snap the ball against Penn State, but, that's pretty common in that environment, no matter who you are or what year you are. It's arguably the toughest environment to play in in our league. Um, but uh, the, the, the one thing that has been a constant is J.J. McCarthy's QBR in these three games that, uh, that Sharon Moore has performed all three of these tasks is 55.2, I believe. And the rest of the season, his QBR is 91.9. And no, it's not the, it's not the Penn State game where he only threw the ball seven times. He actually had a QBR over 90 in that game. Actually, there it is, 55.4 to 91.9. It's Bowling Green, last week against Maryland. Now he started out great against Maryland, threw a pick before the half, and then kind of never responded. But that's another concern I have, where the only two games this year where he threw a pick, you know, this, this wasn't Jared Goff coming back, like for my Lions uh, last Sunday, throwing three picks and then leading one of the best comebacks in the history of the franchise. Um, when he threw three interceptions against Bowling Green, he was down and kind of stayed down. When he threw that pick at the end of the half against against Maryland, he was down and kind of stayed down. So I, I don't. There's got to be some quantifiable, quantifiable effect having a coach whose playing style was very similar to yours, wore that uniform, played the same position at the same university, knows exactly what you're facing, knows exactly what you're thinking, has coached at the highest level of football at the exact same time. There must be something quantifiable to that. I, I don't know exactly what it is. I, you know, you know, I'm a data guy. I can't put a number on it. I, I just know the number's higher than zero. And that's, that's my biggest concern is if – that's the one thing we've not seen J.J. do in-game yet this year is he's either been great and he's been great most of the year, like all Big Ten, borderline All-American great, or not good. Like, you know, there hasn't been, yeah, he was okay. Like we saw a lot of that last year. And then against Ohio State, he had his best game of his career. He's been like Heisman Trophy candidate or, you know, you're doing the Steve Carrill yikes, okay? We've not seen him – get punched in the mouth early. I don't mean take a hit. I mean make a mistake and then rebound from that. That's the one thing we have yet to see him do. And and he could very well be in that situation against this opponent come Saturday. Maybe it's not the Jimmies and Joes. Maybe it's the Jimmies and Moes, if you follow me there. Uh, Sharon Moore, I tried tried something. <laughs> so uh, for Ohio State, it's it's between the ears. And you're talking about between the ears for one player I'm talking about for the entire team. And I had this question about this team going into Georgia, but they had three weeks to recover. And I thought that they might be demoralized against Michigan and not be able to look at Georgia and think, how in the world can we win this game? And they delivered. Now, did they deliver the win? Of course not, but I, <laughs> they delivered a performance uh, that was respectable and you know, as good as anybody in the country last year. So they delivered there. But 
there is something there. There's so much psychological warfare going on right now. And when you and I were having this conversation two years ago and before, it was all about, well, Ohio State, they've been able to master this uh, just Mm -hmm. overconfidence, just this great level of confidence bordering on arrogance, but still a worth ethic and a determination and a laser focus to marry with that to just deliver these efforts and that Michigan was was fragile and for good reason, losing year after year. But I knew as soon as that broke that it could get ugly and it could flip rather quickly, and it did in 2021. So I don't know how Ohio State gets that back or if it's just a matter of these are athletes and they're 20 years old and they're resilient and they can go out there and once they start running and hitting, that leaves them to a certain extent and uh, yeah, it's it's. I don't think it's gonna. I don't think Ohio State's gonna wilt and melt the first series of the game. But at what point do they get punched in the mouth, and how do they respond? They did not respond the, either of the last two seasons. More from a physical standpoint, I think two years ago. More from a mental standpoint, did they not respond last year? What happens? So if you look at the history of your school. Uh, I I think there's only been one coach ever at Ohio State that was permitted to lose three in a row to Michigan and didn't lose his job. That was John Cooper. You could correct me on the history on that, but if that's not right, it might be one other coach that was permitted to do that. And you know, it it's just not something that is traditionally permitted there in Columbus. If If Ohio State loses, this would be three in a row for Ryan Day. Who has beaten everybody else, basically, and not just beaten them, but humiliated them. But then you would lose to a team without a coach, basically. You'd lose to an offensive coordinator who's, what, 34, 35 years old. What's the mood in Columbus if that happens? Well, the mood is different than what's going to happen to Ryan Day. Yeah, the mood among the fan base is the fan base is going to be about 10 or 15% logical and about 90% lunacy. Uh, wanting him ousted immediately. Now, if he racks up 11 win seasons and this goes on for five years or even four, I'm in a different place. But this is a really good Michigan team that they're facing. They're facing legitimately a top two or three team in the country, and they're facing them on the road, and they know that they don't have an elite quarterback So if they go out there, and I'm not into moral victories by any stretch of the imagination, I expect this team to go up there and win the game. Uh, But if they lose this game and they show that he had a game plan, he had them prepared, and they just physically lost a really good game, 24-21, that's different than what we've seen the last two years, first of all. Secondly, the rest of the schedule can't be completely discounted. I know that this is unlike any other Any other example we have in sports that I can think of, it's almost like Ali and Frazier back, you know, 50 Hmm. years ago fighting in the 70s where that's it. That's you're determined based on just beating that guy, that team. Um, But this program has lost to anybody in the Big Ten since October of 2018 besides these two games to Michigan. You can't fire him. Could you do a situation where you're like, yeah, you know, Bears are looking for a new coach and your QB one's there. Go take that puppy over and have a nice life and uh, go try to win a Super Bowl or. The problem, Steve, is not just the firing, it's the hiring. And you have it, you're replacing an AD and everything else there. Yeah, I hear you. It would, it would be, I, I mean, that's part of the thing for me. I, I can't imagine Ryan Day losing to a team with no coach. Like I just. I have a hard time envisioning that. I think there are several matchups in this game that favor Michigan. Um, I think the defensive line versus your offensive line does. I think our running will be able to run the ball. I still I don't know that it'll be you know what Hassan Haskins did two years ago, or we're going to be you know watching Donovan Edwards you know run to you know Akron. Okay, but I, I think we're going to run the ball fairly effectively. Um, I just have a hard time believing, though that Ryan Day is going to lose to a team that doesn't have a coach. I am mentally, I'm having a hard time getting around that. I keep coming back to that. How, how is Ryan Day 
and a team this team going to lose to a team that doesn't have a coach? Jim Harbaugh's coaching the team up until game time, basically, up until the trip to the stadium. He is the head coach, and the coordinators are the most important guys on the field during the game. Okay. From a from a execution standpoint. I mean, I'm married to my wife all the time, too, but if I'm not there when she's ovulating, no babies are getting made. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there is something to be said for being there on game day, brother. You know what I mean? Something to be said for it, right? Otherwise, all the coaches would just take the day off. Okay. How do I counter that? <laughs> all right, give me a prediction. What do you think happens? Ohio State wins 24-21. What would it take for you to predict Michigan to win this game? Like in any year, ever. Exactly. All right. The last two, the last two years, I thought about picking Michigan, and I just couldn't do it. I thought, but but I, I thought, it was in my brain. I thought about it. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great Thanksgiving, Mark. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Same to you, Steve. <laughs> I thought Thanks. about it once, and then I knew better. <laughs> Thank you, man. Have a good holiday. Seriously, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Steve. You bet. This week's Twitter poll results: We asked you who wins the game. 57% of you said Michigan, 43% of you said Ohio State. Which brings us to our feedback of the week from Nate. Sh Sharon Moore is just not getting it done as head coach. The three games he's coached Michigan at 315 yards or less. The other eight games, 400 yards or more. And J.J. with him at the helm looks lost, so I'm sadly taking Ohio State 27-20. I think based on the data that I presented here, which which quantifies what you are instinctively seeing, Nate, I, I can't blame that. I can't blame you for that at all. Not to mention last year I took Ohio State to win this game and we won and it worked out perfect for me. So and I've already made my emotional hedge bet. I know that makes some of my Michigan fans mad. I don't really care. But um it it helps me not to have the rest of my day ruined and then ruin the rest of my day of everybody around me, you know? So if we're going to lose, I already put a hundy on Ohio State money line, so I'll collect about 250 bucks. You know, it's a nice uh, little windfall. A um, little spoonful of sugar to help uh, that scarlet and gray medicine go down. Um, but if Jimmy were here, I'd absolutely pick Michigan to win the game because I do think there are at least two, if not three, matchups that heavily favor Michigan in the game. But without the head coach here, I'm, I, I really don't know what to think. I don't. So we'll find out Saturday. We would love uh, to find out whether you uh, liked us, rated us, subscribed to us, gave us a five-star review. Please do all those things. Share, follow, uh, help us to find more people here on YouTube and on iTunes as well if you're listening there. Thank you. And thanks to all of you that do those things for us to help us find more Michigan fans just like you. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, including game day at Michigan Podcast on Twitter, at Michigan Podcast there. Until then, hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. May the good guys win the game again. I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.